three, two, one. All right. Well, welcome to the Snohomish County 2017-2018 Volunteer Update. We're hoping that you find this format more convenient, and this recording will stay on the website until the end of December if you need to come back and check on something that you might have missed. Um, Beth is here with me. You can see her there. We'll actually just do this right here like this. That'll work better. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the time and talent that you contribute to our program. Um, without our volunteers, we would be unable to um, have the capacity to reach the number of youth that we are able to reach out to. And I can tell you that both myself and the rest of the staff, we are very thankful for all of the time that you guys do give to the program. So even though this is a recorded format, there is gonna be a short quiz at the end of it. And um, the uh, there's a bit of a, it's not really an evaluation, but it's like a feedback. And we would really like for you guys to, uh, well, well it, in order for you to get credit for this, you're going to have to go back and um, review that and submit that online for us so that we know that you have participated in um, the, uh, update this year. So I'm going to start a PowerPoint here and we're going to be flipping between uh, sharing our screen and not so please be patient with us uh, and let's let's get started for tonight. So first of all the one thing that I want you to remember don't forget well how did I get on there? Oh I've got the wrong screen hang on a moment i got two things up for some reason. All right, here we go. So, again, you'll see the, the bouncing, the bouncing notice. Be sure and take that survey at the end. Otherwise, we won't know that you have participated in this update. So, uh, the first thing that I always like to do in these updates is uh, remind you that we really do need to take a look at our year in review, go back and look at it and see exactly how we think we did for the year. Um, while it may be, you know, you may consider it to be some kind of a, a exercise, it's also really important for the teaching of life skills for our youth. Uh, it helps them to understand that we all need to set goals. We need to make some decisions throughout the year as to how we're going to try to reach those goals. And then um, we're going to uh, need to do some self-evaluation to see if we have met the goals. So this is one of the things that we like to hit on in um, our updates. A couple other things that we're going to be covering uh, this during this update is um, Gaining an understanding of the new state fees. We do have a new state fee uh, assessed this year for each member. I'm looking at resiliency from both uh, what we can do to help kids and then what we can do to help ourselves whenever we are working with youth. Um, taking a look at, a, at some revisions in the uh, Evolve Education Program for Volunteers, reviewing policies, finances, and um, wind up with a, a little bit of a review of some new policies that we have and some ways to integrate experiential education into our program. So I know it's a lot, but keep in mind, it's not gonna be a quiz at the end, it's just some reflection questions. So one thing that I want you to do is, I would like for you to write down, just take a few seconds and write down your, um, some of the something that you think you and your club did really well this year and 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 an example of how you found some kind of growth in your kids as a result of something your club did so i'm going to give you about a minute to think about that and then write something down So that's really only been a half a minute, but we all know silence is, is awkward. So while you're thinking about that, I'd also like you to take a little bit of time to 
uh, try to think if see if there's things that you think you guys might have done differently or could have done better that would have resulted in a little bit better um, in reaching your goals or, or something that maybe you needed to tweak along the way you realized that uh, it wasn't going quite the way you wanted it to so I'll give you a little bit more time to write those down So we're going to go ahead and move on here, but if you do need some more time to think about those things and write them down, just go ahead and hit the pause button on the recording and, and finish this little exercise. Um, what are the things that uh, I like to ask people to do, and that we actually we're requiring people to do, is to complete a budget for the upcoming year. And this is actually a really good exercise to help your club members look at setting goals, figuring out, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, how do we know how much money we're going to spend? Well, that's part of defi deciding what activities you want to do, figuring out how much they cost, and then figuring out how much money you think you can raise, and prioritizing what activities you're going to do. So try to spend some time with your club. And remember that our youth need this experience. They need the experience in making group decisions. They need this experience in learning how to uh, apportion their resources to their priorities. And, and they need to learn how to work together as a team. So we've been getting some questions lately about record retention. Uh, number one, all financial records have to be uh, maintained for at least six years and member records need to be maintained up to age 19 or at least six years. So if they start at the age of seven and they exit the age of uh, six years later, or if they start at seven, let's say they leave at eight and in, at the age of 14, you can go ahead and destroy those records. So you, you do need to destroy them. They do have personal information in it. Uh, if you don't have the capacity or the ability to get those documents shredded, please feel free to bring them in here to our office and we will make sure that we take care of that. So the next topic is probably the most impactful change we're gonna experience this year and that's the implementation of fees at the state level. Uh, we've been very successful writing grants for 4-H in the past few years, but the grants are pretty much limited to new programs and new expenses. Uh, the state office has been good stewards of their funds, but as their expenses continue to climb and our budgets continue to decline, uh, we find that we would end up in a deficit position without some fee assessment. Um, the state fee this year will be $25 per child, and in order to continue to supplement our expenses here in the county, we are going to tack on uh, just $5 instead of the $10 that we uh, had charged in the past. Um, please keep in mind other counties may charge a higher fee. Um, some counties may choose not to, not to fund anything at all for their own county expenses. And that is a lot, uh, it's reliant upon what kind of support they have locally and the size of their program. <clears throat> Uh, so here in Snohomish County, we use our county fee to help provide support to keep one of our staff positions at full time and to pay for overhead, uh, overhead expenses like copying supplies, uh, some technology equipment, uh, marketing, promotion, things like that. Uh, I, I do understand that our, our, this, this fee may prove to be a barrier to some youth to be able to participate. I know we have families that can't afford this fee, um, but what I'd like to do is ask each club to work with the members to develop a financial assistance fund to help pay for those fees. So this fund should actually be in your budget, um, and it, it should be a part of all fundraising efforts. So a portion of fundraising should go into that. Um, please keep in mind that uh, you do not have to, you don't have to participate in, um, promote in product sales or any statewide fundraiser for 4-H. Uh, we do not have that requirement as most other youth organizations do. Um, 
we do, we have looked at our fees, we've compared them to other organizations and we are uh, pretty much uh, right in the money with uh, the amount that we're charging at $25 plus the $5 county fee to make it 30. So the fee is payable at enrollment. If you have youth in your club that need financial assistance, please let me know. We'll work together to meet those needs. And um, I think that uh, we, we have come to the point where we realize we are going to have funds. So rather than try to oppose the, Im the implementation of funds, we need to just look at how we can be good stewards and work together to make that happen for our kids. So this is where the state, there's a, this is a graphic, this is where the state is going to, um, where, where they're gonna be spending their money. And please keep in mind that in the past, the state has been uh, given budget money out of the amount of budget that is given to Washington State University from the legislature to pay for these things, but due to budget cuts and budget deficits, they're no longer able to provide this. So 10% is gonna go into marketing and growth. This is coming up with some nice marketing materials that will help uh, promote 4-H in the community and will help us in um, uh, trying to dispel the, the notion that 4-H is the best kept secret. Uh, the 35% the of this amount is going to go into some quality education programming. Um, one of them is helping to pay for things like we've just gone, gone through the process of uh, comparing our policies with WSU to make sure that we are in financial compliance with the university's policies and procedures. It'll help to provide uh, quality training for uh, staff and, and volunteers, but it also will help to provide some program leadership at the state level for some of our programs where we don't have faculty at the state level providing leadership. Uh, and then 55% of this fee is gonna go to uh, safe, and, safe environment and risk management. Um, we are uh, gonna begin this year each volunteer will be scrutinized through a national background check and those will happen all those will happen every year in addition uh, the state will be buying blanket insurance similar to the insurance we have purchased in the past uh, it, but um, this insurance is going to have a little bit higher benefit our benefit was uh, capped at 1500 and I believe the state benefit is capped at 2500 so it's going to help pay some of those expenses please join with me in understanding that these expenses are necessary in order to maintain a youth development program. And we are probably very lucky that we haven't had to pay fees up until now. So this fee is gonna be collected during enrollment. It's gonna be through debit or credit card only. If the club decides to fund this fee, the club basically has two choices. Uh, the first one is they can reimburse the families with a check from the club make sure that you get a receipt. You guys will hear me say that. Um, if you need one, uh, we can put one up on the volunteer update webpage for you, so you should be able to pull that down. And second, uh, members can enroll and just stop short of making that payment and perhaps come to a club meeting or whatever, and the club could pay that with a debit card. Um, I apologize that we are unable to do batch payments for our member fees. So um, to me, uh, I think reimbursing families with a check would be a lot less cumbersome than trying to use your county or your club debit card. So remember, uh, we do understand that this fee may be a hardship to some. And if you have youth that do need to get some financial assistance to be able to afford this, please let us know. Our fee is not gonna go away. It's in place for at least three years. And what that means is it will not be raised either. So um, we just need to work together to try to figure out how to make that fee and how to make sure that our kids uh, get to participate in this, um, in, in this program. So I'm gonna throw it over to Beth at this point. Still the screen. Yes, we are still sharing the screen. Here is where you can find more information about uh, the two documents, actually, those two documents that are showed you up here, a guide to Washington State 4-H enrollment fee and the our priority commitments here. Those both are located on the 
the our extension website here and I have to tell you there's a mistake there because that should say in fact uh, I'm gonna fix it right here in front of y'all so you guys can see what I'm doing but this needs to say Snohomish right there and a slash so um, that is the web address for being able to find that information so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and Beth it's to you now all right hey everybody we're gonna go through a little resilience uh, exercise and reflection today if you were at the update last year you received a bookmark that looks like this and they are on and you see that they're on the the link for this year's update links so you can find it if you if you didn't get it last year it's called quick tips to nurture resilience in children and one of these tips is self-care so as adults working with youth it should be fairly obvious that if you take care of yourself, that it increases your resilience. But I want you to consider the fact that if you take care of yourself, it also increases the resilience of the youth that you work with and other people that you interact with in your life. This is a, a similar idea to sharpening the saw. Thank you, Stephen Covey, uh, for that analogy. So if there's a tool that you use every day, um, like if you're a carpenter, you might have a saw, for example, then you know that you have to clean it, you have to sharpen it, you have to keep it in good condition so that you can use it again tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. We are like those saws. So we have to, we have to continually take care of ourselves. We have to keep ourselves sharp and in good shape so that we are able to uh, be in good shape physically and mentally tomorrow and the next day and put our best selves forward. So anyone who spends significant time and energy caring for others, including 4-H volunteers, is at risk of burnout. Uh, the same uh, filmmakers who created the film Paper Tigers, and uh, that's about adverse childhood experiences. We showed you a little preview of Paper Tigers last year, a little trailer. And uh, those same folks made another great film called Resilience, which you should see if you ever come across it. They've put together a thoughtful little piece on caregiver burnout that we're going to show you now. And then we'll have some reflection questions at the end of it. to come across is um, number one the experience of vicarious trauma right how we as caregivers feel in caring for families who are struggling with these issues and it does lead to a lot of burnout it, it can lead to a lot of burnout hi the fortunate thing is that my job is investigating the best science for stress reduction, <laughs> right? And so I definitely practice what I preach. Fantastic. You look great. We have to build in systems that allow folks to take, you know, what I in my medical language would call universal precaution. If you're going to take care of a patient and they have a communicable disease, Right, you have to put your mask on. Self-care, peer support, counseling, mentoring, when they're getting to that point where they said, you know what, I have just been managing a really tough case for uh, a fair amount of time. I need to, I need to take a day off. Good morning. Good morning. One of the pieces, for example, that we did at the Center for Youth Wellness was we were able to get 
our entire team trained on meditation. And what we found was that that led to significant decreases in folks' experience of stress in their day-to-day -day jobs and um, satisfaction. All right, any positive patient updates? We spend a lot of time with things that don't work or aren't working or are challenging or things that fail. Mom is not in the picture of any kind of clear story as to why mom is not. And so you have to, I feel like, get real comfortable with working with something that feels like um, it's, it's not working exactly the way that you'd like it to. And not only doing that, but, but motivating an entire team to figure out how do we bring our best to that situation. One of the things that families that experience a lot of adversity frequently may see is high turnover among the institutions that are caring for them. It's a best practice, not only in uh, self-care on the organizational level, but also in providing care to our families to make sure that we're gonna be able to be here to do the work. experienced a lot of that turmoil it's hard not to just say well let's scoop you up and I got an extra room at home and you can just stay there I'm not their parent and I have to establish those boundaries not just for them but for myself you know when I go home I can't I have my own kids that I need to worry about and I can't keep carrying that home so I think that's probably the hardest part I can't solve all the problems for these kids and um, I don't know that I'd want to because I don't know that I would be the same person had someone just walked in and handed me everything and figured it all out. I mean, I kind of feel like the struggles that I went through were for purpose and that it's made me the person that I am. And so I try to pass that to these kids that I don't know why right now you're doing this. I don't know why your parents kicked you out. I don't know why they use and tell you they hate you. No clue. But what I do know is at some point in your life, if you get through this, one, you're going to be probably one of the strongest people I know. And two, you're going to see the point of why you had gone through it. I feel for you, dude, like not knowing what to expect. So, yeah. so uh, I mean, you have my number, you got your grandma's number. Why do some of them make it and why do some of them not? Um, I like to think that I got to contribute to some of those kids that make it, that they had that one or two or three people in their life that didn't give up on them. I don't know. I just, everyone says they hate drama. Everyone says that it finds them. Again, None of our students are always exploding. None of our kids are always emotionally charged. Um, they're capable of going there quickly. If I just wanted to not get angry all the time, can I just not get angry all the time because I want to not get angry all the time? And when one of our students is having a day where you can just see they're elevated, they walk through the door and they're just radiating that energy, um, that's not about me, that's not about the teacher, that's about uh, something that's going on in that kid's life and uh, clearly that kid hurts, the kid's having a bad day. This way of a brain that is just like this finely tuned survival brain that I can't take it personally if that behavior is not their choice. If they're not choosing to be a jerk in my room, then I have to let that go. And I want your wisdom to help me figure this out. <laughs> you sure? You got it? So you're right in the center. Even if I don't know, uh, the future is going to hold for these kids, knowing that today, instead of just staying home and doing nothing with their life, they came to us. I know they're going to be unconditionally loved for uh, a year or two or three or four of their life. They learned something that they didn't know before. They became better human beings. If even just for a little bit, you look at the smiles on their faces and that's enough to keep me coming back. I am sad. I'm gonna write because because okay, that's a third grade word. How can we figure it out? Show me, show me. But 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 do it. Let's erase. I 
don't worry about burnout because I do things for myself that I hope prevent that. So I, I've taken up running. I, I get in the car and literally like no music, no talk radio, just nothing, just quiet. So I live about 30 minutes from work. So I've got 30 minutes to shake it off and to go into my home now because here comes job number four is now being a parent and working with my own children. And then when I leave home, I've got 30 minutes to get totally ready to be at school. So I use that time to just decompress, get ready to do it all over again. And, and I really, I mean, I really love what I do. shared a lot of the challenges that she went through that um, has impacted her life as a child into her adulthood. So, but, but thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully we can, you know, talk about more ways as a group that can help us unbottle some of that stuff. She was very open about being involved in uh, domestic violence. Uh, you know, we spend a considerable amount of time in the office as we do in the homes. We do some meditation. And we do some reading exercises ourselves and we take walks we go get our coffee <laughs> and, and that's been really helpful i mean a lot of times we just have to get up and get out i have my partner that i work with and you know i was like girl you, can you believe this you know kind of thing but she's not judgmental and you know she just listens and so it's just kind of like Got that off. Now we can get back to work. <laughs> you know, our clients to get to a place where they yeah. have been empowered. Yeah. Sometimes you can do so much, but then you don't feel like it's appreciated. And I said, you know what? What we have to keep in mind is all we know is we do the best that we can do. Everybody says, you know, people like us, you know that you know do it we get so burnt out we'll get burnt out quickly and after 21 years the day that i become immune the day that i become desensitized to what people go through is the day i quit my job right because yeah, we, how can we do we it can. without killing i know we do and i think that you know caring for them and helping them and seeing them have hope gives us hope to keep doing what we exactly. do exactly but that that's great i mean it's, it's, it's a lot of work, it's hard work. Secondary traumatic stress is a, is a normal reaction to abnormal circumstances. And I'll, you can see I'm trying to emphasize this. So I don't want folks in the room that might feel like you're experiencing these things to feel like if there's something wrong with you, or um, I would say the opposite. Um, and I think that much like having ACEs happen over and over and over again, and how that impacts us, hearing about people who have experienced ACEs over and over and over again can certainly have an impact on us. Self-care is an ethical imperative. We have an obligation to our clients, as well as to ourselves, our colleagues, and our loved ones not to be damaged by the work that we do. I think it's interesting that many of our professions have codes of ethics that deal with how we treat our clients, and that's essential. Uh, but we don't say much about how we treat each other or how we, we treat ourselves. And I, I think that would be a paradigm shift that would be helpful. How many of you have uh, uh, heard of burnout? Experience burnout? See a few liars in the room? Yeah, see a few liars in the room. This can be tough, overwhelming work, right? And what I've come to really appreciate about working with the Center for Youth Wellness is that they believe in self-care. And one of the best ways to take care of yourself is to move. So there is no better way to move than to dance. So is there some music we could get on? All right, so anybody who wants to join with the staff, myself, get on up and let's shake it off. We're all the Taylor Swift. That's what people say. That's what people say. Okay, slide. 
Um, can we get the PowerPoint slide? All right, a few questions to think about. First of all, what do you do to decompress? Maybe you run, dance, or commune with animals. Maybe you vent to a trusted friend. Maybe you write in a journal or soak in a tub. What do you do? Second question, what boundaries do you have or do you need to establish to prevent burnout? These could be boundaries around when you're available, around when you respond to your phone, around your time with your family. For example, when I go to bed, I silence my phone completely. I don't hear it vibrate, buzz, nothing. It's totally off. Sleep time is sacred for me. So what do you do or what do you need to do to protect yourself? And finally, start a list of everyone who benefits when you take care of yourself. I only said start a list because it's probably an endless list. If you need more time, don't worry. You can continue thinking about all of those questions when you complete the survey at the end. When do you get to get to take the survey? At the end, right? It's at the end, which is after the last segment featuring a group of 4-H child movie stars that you won't want to miss, demonstrating a very important educational concept. That was a shameless plug. Our next topic is volunteer education. So we have this system called Evolve that you might have heard of. And if you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to explain it to you. Evolve stands for Enhancing Vital Organizational and Leadership Skills Through Volunteer Education. It includes both classes for all volunteers in various roles, like club leader classes and project leader classes, um, as well as classes, which if you attend and you're an enrolled volunteer of any kind, you can earn these nifty pins. See them? They're really pretty. Dingle boppers, some people call them. Lovely. So let me show you uh, how you can find information about the Evolve system. So if you go to our website, which Jana's gonna take us to, there's our website, and you that's our county website. So if you click on programs and then 4-H Youth Development, and then the volunteers page, you'll get this page that has a bunch of red buttons on the right. And there's one down there that says volunteer education, evolve. And when you click on that, you'll get the whole evolve handout there. So we have renamed a few of the classes for this year. And I wanna explain that to you. They're pretty basic, pretty straightforward, easy to understand. So what used to be called reason slash judging or conducting judging events is now gonna be called teaching judging. And what used to be Edmodo books has been changed to teaching record keeping. Um, event and committee leadership has been simplified to committee leadership, council board officer simplified to just board officer, and organize your life, which was kind of intimidating in the first place, is now called organizational skills. So there are just a few changes to the actual pins. Can we get the Evolve page back on the handout? There we go. So the organizational leadership pin is basically the same. Um, for the group facilitation pin, there's a new required class, committee leadership. Uh, there used to be a class on this list called successful club meetings. That is now, that topic is now going to be covered in the group called, group, uh, the class called group basics. So it's no longer listed there. Um, the youth development pin has been updated to include teaching record keeping as a requirement. Experiential education has been removed from this list, but if you want to learn more about experiential education, you can certainly take the project leadership class and watch the rest of this update, more on that topic. Um, Edmodo record books has also been removed from the elective list for that pin. Now, uh, for the personal development pin, we've taken out the build your resume topic. You may notice that there's a new category in each pin on the electives list called other 
From time to time, on an ad hoc basis, we may designate a class that you could take that would count as an elective for a particular pin. For example, on November 30th, we're offering a class on suicide prevention, which is taught by the Snohomish Health District. And if you attend that class, you can count it as an elective. So this year, we have also designated some classes at the 4-H uh, Leaders Forum that will count toward pins, the state forum. And here's where you can get to that from the volunteer page. See that button at the bottom, get credit for forum classes. There you can see in the margins are indicated, uh, is indicated what credits you can get for certain classes. And on the last page of the schedule is a little a series of slips that you can fill out, get the instructor to sign those if you want to get credit for those classes. Okay. Oh, my spidey senses are tingling because somebody out there is wondering, can I get credit for some other class that I took or that I'm going to take toward these pins? Well, maybe you can. Can we get that Evolve screen yes. back again? So you'll see after some of the classes, there's a little carrot, which is also called party hat in my life. And if a class has a carrot next to it, then that means it must be taught um, in Snohomish County 4-H. So if it does not have a carrot, you might be able to get credit for it in some other way from some other class that you took. It says at the bottom of the page there how to petition for alternative credit for those classes. All right. Let's move down to the third page of the Evolve document, the bubble page. There are the requirements for people in specific roles. So aside from the name changes that we already covered, the only change here is the addition of teaching record keeping as a class for the main club leader. Oh, spidey senses are tingling again. Everyone wants to know, when can I take these exciting classes? Let me show you where you can sign up for those. Back to that volunteer page of our website, there is a red button called Sign Up for Volunteer Education, Fall Dates. And if you click on that, it'll take you here to the Sign Up Genius. Across the top are various dates. The home page is set to our Saturday when we have many, many classes offered. But there are a lot of other dates when you can take various classes there. So you can certainly page through there. It's where you can sign up for the suicide prevention class. Um, and any other classes that you'd like to take. Come one, come all, everyone is welcome. All right, back to me now. And, um, let's see what I go here. And I'm gonna give a shameless plug here for our council fundraiser. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we don't have to participate in any statewide fundraiser, but we do have to participate in a countywide fundraiser. Uh, we work with the United Northwest Model Railroad Club to sponsor the Washington State Model Train Show and Marketplace. It's held at the fairgrounds, and next year it'll be February 24th to the 25th. We expect each club to take one or two shifts, but what that means is out of your club, you need to cover somewhere between two and six hours on one of these two dates, and that's your obligation for the year. It's the only fundraiser that the 4-H Council engages in, and it's fun, and you get to go to the train show free. You don't have to pay to get in. It'd be kind of bad of us if we made you pay to come in and work. Uh, there's some, some uh, limitations about how old you have to be to do certain things. Uh, if you want to sell tickets or do any fund handling, and you will talk about this a little bit later on also, you do have to be an enrolled volunteer. And I uh, like the parking and the parking lots, helping that, you do have to be, I think, at least age 16. So you can go to the Sign Up Genius down here. If you can't find that, I'm sure we'll have a link on our webpage before too long of where you can go to, to sign up for your shift. Uh, I will tell you, you get the best shifts if you sign up early, and the Sign Up Genius is live right now, so the sooner you get in there, the better chance you have of picking the thing you want to do. So, we've done a real good job of incorporating some of the new financial policies from last year. Uh, it seems like more people are completing receipts and doing treasurer's reports and managing their funds appropriately. However, 
Uh, we still did get some audited books in that we did that did not have receipts uh, for the purchases. This is really not an option. This isn't uh, something you can choose to do or not to do. So you have to have a receipt for every expenditure that you do not, that, that you spend. If you lose a receipt, there is a way to cover that. So um, check, with, check in the Club Treasurer Handbook or the Club Treasurer Handbook Facilitator Guide or give us a call here and we can talk to you about that. Um, Again, I, I am hearing that we've got clubs operating with a cash treasury fund. Uh, this changed last year. There can be absolutely no money collected and or expended on behalf of the club uh, without a bank account for those funds to go through. Um, there is no co-mingling. And by co-mingling, I mean the club leader gets everybody's money deposited in their personal checking account and then writes a check for the expense. If we're going to be collecting money from members or collecting money from anywhere, we need to have a bank account to facilitate that process. Uh, two signatures on the checks. And please, I, I beg of you, if you are going to send a check into my office, please make sure it has two signatures on it. I'm, I'm going to question your sincerity if it doesn't. Uh, so there are no exceptions to that. And please keep in mind, anybody, we are public organizations, anybody has a right, any of your members have a right, and their parents, by the way, to request a look at what you're doing with your finances. It does not mean that they don't trust you, but a lot of people like to know what the organizations are doing that they're involved with. So anybody can request those records. And, you know, in, in my book, I want my records to look really good. I don't want to have to look at somebody and say, you know, trust me, they, this is really okay. So as long as you keep records and you write down your transactions, you should have no problem uh, with showing somebody your books. Uh, sometimes I know we get a little bit behind. That's not a big issue. As long as you have the documentation, that's, that's cool. Um, also, if you have any trouble finding a bank, because we don't want you, you know, having a budget of $200 and having to spend 150 of it in bank fees, if you have trouble finding a bank, please give us a call. We do have some banks that um, we use that um, are really, um, really 4-H friendly. So, um, please keep in mind that checks are not receipts. Uh, and all tra cash transactions have to have receipts as well. Um, and when I say receipts, that means if you pull money out of the bank and give it to somebody that's gonna like open up the bake sale, there needs to be a receipt whenever that money changes hands. If you give $100 to Susie 4-H's mom, because she's gonna be the one at the first shift of the bake sale, you should have something written on the paper, I gave, $100 to Susie 4 hers mom for the bank sale on this date and have Susie 4 hers mom sign that out. And then if she transfers funds to anybody, or it could be Susie 4 hers dad too, if they transfer funds to anybody else, they should count out those funds and, and write a receipt because we want a good trail of what's happening with our money. And then in the end, any money that is given back to go into the treasury, if there's been expenses paid out of that money, even though it was cash, you still need a receipt to prove that that was actually spent on something that it's supposed to be spent on. Um, and please keep in mind, uh, when we talk about your treasury, that, uh, that you know, we've had a lot of things in the news lately and people are a little bit more diligent about finding out what's going on with their children's organizations. Um, next, please make sure, certain that your treasurer is actually the person that's doing the treasury job. Um, you can ask the treasurer and facilitate the treasurer being able to go to the January, I'm sorry, the November 4th club officer training. They'll get trained on how to take records, how to keep records, um, and then, you know, by January or February, they should be able to handle that treasury without a lot of guidance. Um, but remember, your job is to guide them through. Um, reference both of the handbooks that are available on our website and, and work together to help that club treasurer know what they're supposed to be doing. So we do have some uh, policy uh, changes for this year. Uh, for some reason, the checks must have two signatures. 
uh, didn't get into the state policy document. Um, when we say it has to have two signatures, a, anybody that signs the check has to be an enrolled volunteer. Um, however, the, the person that signs on the line of the check has to be on that checking account. The other person doesn't have to. They could sign it in the memo section. They can initial it somewhere else. But it just says that they looked it over and that it was written for an, for a, a, an expense that was legitimate. Um, if somebody asks you to do that and they don't produce you with a receipt, don't sign it. I've had a couple people ask me to sign checks and I'm like, well, I, I need to see the receipt for what you're spending this for. That's, that's our job. That's the way that we do what we call due diligence. Um, anybody, any group that's not organized as a club, so like a program or 4-H council or whatever, has to have an extension faculty or staff on that account. That's just to facilitate accessibility of the funds should something happen and we end up with no signers available. Um, all funds have to be managed and handled by certified volunteers um, and enrolled members. So if, you, if your volunteers are not certified and your members are not enrolled, they should not be handling any money. And it is appropriate for clubs to choose to use their debit cards again for membership fees. So we also have some county policies that are uh, going to be going into effect this year in uh, Snohomish County. And I'm going to um, see if I can get to where I need to go to to show you where those at are at. Um, if you go back here to the main web page, you go into the 4-H Youth Development, you go into the resources page, and there is somewhere down here, Snohomish County specific policies. So there's, there's a few of them. And the left-hand side over here references those state policies that we are um, referring to. So number one, if we're going to post a picture that could somehow identify a kid, we want to make sure that we use only the first or the last name. We cannot use both. Um, the next one, 6.3, uh, we're not requiring a program of work to be submitted in Snohomish County. Rather, we would like to have your budget submit submitted and that your budget should detail your activities for us so that we know what your club's going to be doing. Uh, state policy section 7.3.1, um, clubs must have an enrolled project leader uh, for each project that's offered in that club. So you, if, you're a, if you are in a club that's a dog club and you got a kid that wants to do foods and nutrition, if you don't have a foods and nutrition project leader, you either need to recruit somebody to be that project leader or you should refer that, that member to another club to be able to uh, participate in that project. Um, 7.5, uh, in the Homish County, the, if a volunteer fails to enroll for three consecutive years, they're going to be considered a reapplication as a volunteer. So they will have to go through uh, the application process, having an interview, getting references, background check, which everybody's going to be background checked anyway, and they may be required to retake some of the training. State policy section 8.1, all youth must participate in at least one county level educational activity to be eligible to exhibit at the Evergreen State Fair. Um, the way this works is we provide the fair with a list of youth that are eligible to participate. And it is the superintendent's responsibility to make sure that each youth in their department is eligible and has met the requirements necessary. Um, if your club is interested in hosting a county level uh, event that would help to help members reach this requirement, please contact your program leader and see if, um, you know, work with your program leader to make sure that you've got everything you need for that county level um, project. Uh, the program leader may uh, choose not to allocate any additional workshops depending upon the schedule and how many, if there's duplications or anything. So state policy section 8.2 and 13.3.2 is the minimum age of chaperones. Uh, the state lists the minimum age of chaperones at 21. Uh, for our purposes, the chaperone age of 21 is minimum for uh, participating in overnights at the, at the county level and at the club level or any activities within the county. If they are planning on doing state and beyond the county activities, we require that that our chaperones are age 25. 
And in 13.3.1, uh, the state says that youth and children, uh, youth and adults cannot share the same sleeping quarters. However, there could be some circumstances where we allow that. Um, the example I can give you right off the top is the dog caper. Uh, we have 300 people sleeping in the same room. The guys are on one side, the gals are on the other side. There's adults there with almost every kid, and we have somebody staying up overnight. So it's not where youth can get behind a closed door and do things that we are not able to observe and provide the appropriate um, adult supervision for. So if you think that you have an event that you feel should be granted an exception to that policy, please, you know, get a hold of me and we'll talk about it and make sure that it does fit within those guidelines. Um, okay. Uh, policy notes, again, state funds, county project leaders, we already went into all those. So the last thing that I want to do here is I want to try to give you guys some insight into integration of experiential education and how, how that can be done without, you don't need any specific equipment or tools. Uh, it's, it's just working the, the whole methodology into something that you already do. So the first thing we're gonna look at is club meetings. And I'm gonna show you just a brief video here, as long as I can find it. Um, and big kudos to all the kids. Yeah. Does anybody have any ideas for a fundraiser? Yes? We could do a big sale. That sounds like a very good idea. Does anybody else have any ideas? Yes? Maybe we could sell those back rides. That is another good idea. Does anybody else have any more good ideas? So this is what we call a broadcast message. Uh, so um, it's where you just ask people to um, self-select to step up and, and provide feedback uh, in, a, in a meeting. So there are some, some pros to this type of uh, asking or solicitating for ideas. Um, basically, it takes a lot less time if you just ask for a broadcast response, and it requires a, a little, it requires very little preparation in the front. However, um, I'm gonna show you another uh, little, um, this is a little bit longer um, movie. And again, uh, these are youth. I put an all call out for our Snohomish County movie stars. And these kids have, um, they stepped up. So uh, we do thank them for their participation. Here's uh, movie number two. Decide what kind of fundraisers we want to do this year. I'd like each one of you to take a moment and write three ideas down. Let's split up into groups of three. What about you? What are you? What are some of your ideas? Um, walking people's dogs. That that could just be pretty good because you know a lot of people have busy schedules and they don't have time to walk their dogs, and it's a good opportunity to do it. Much. What about you? Do you have any? Yeah, a bakery drive. Like you sell bakery, a bakery treats. An original, but I like it. It's a good way to make money. Now, each group decide on three ideas that you think are good fundraisers and write them down on your post-it notes. One person from each group, take, your st take the sticky notes or post-it notes and stick them on the white paper up front. One of you put two colored dots to decide what you think are the top two ideas and put your dot next to each of them. Fundraisers and what you thought was the best fundraiser. Who, who uh, wrote down an idea when you were at your tables? Yeah? Lots of people? And some people didn't. Okay. 
did you share an idea with your group? Okay. How did that feel to have to have to present your idea to a couple of other people? What was it like for you? It was fun. It was fun? You enjoyed sharing it? How about you? I felt like my idea was so I, I felt like there, there was less people, so I actually really had the idea of lots of somebody else was there to actually understand what I was saying. It was better than what I was I feel like something in that in a small group setting, yeah. yeah. Did anybody feel like their their idea was not received well? That other kids didn't like their ideas? What, what did you feel like? I feel like I was a little disrespected that other people were talking a lot louder, and I couldn't really hear like that. Hmm. No. Okay. What about somebody who didn't share an idea? Now, it, like you said, sometimes it's easier to talk in a smaller group than in a bigger group, so those people might not be comfortable speaking in this group either. But if anybody wants to share, or if you want to share why you think somebody might not have talked in your little group, you can share that too. Hessa, what do you think? I think that sometimes, even if it is a smaller group, it still is harder because the other people might have more of a chance to talk than you. Hmm. Sometimes your ideas get talked over? Sometimes. Yeah? Did anybody have an idea that, um, that they didn't get to express? That they wanted to share, maybe? Now, now's a chance. Now, what could we do when we're in our little groups to make sure that everybody feels welcome and comfortable to express their ideas. I know an idea. What's your idea? We could have each person in the group have a certain amount of time to say what they want. Okay. And have the same amount of time, time for each kid so mm -hmm. they This is your don't, minute? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. What, what else? That's and then we can do well, another table. I understand like the idea having taken Taking turns? Okay. Good. Other thoughts? There's no bad idea. Feel free to share anything you want. Okay, what what would you like to do the next time we have to make a decision as a group to make sure we get everybody's ideas? Do you want to try something different? Did you like this method? Do you want to give a time timekeeper to each group or a stopwatch or something? What do you think, Chris? I like this, mes this method of voting, and I think that if you did the time limit as well, that would work out good. Yeah. My only issue with the old time limit thing is that if you have a very complicated idea that would that ended up working really well, you if you had a time limit of 30 seconds or a minute, then you wouldn't be able to explain it well. So, in general, I have an issue with time limits. So, mm -hmm. I think just people saying, hey, you, all of you have 30 minutes to get across your idea or something like that, then everybody, and say, I, I don't know. It's. Mm -hmm. So some ideas might take longer to explain than other ideas. So it might be an initial one minute per person and then some extra time to expand on the ones that need well, more then, explanation. And then they, if it's more complicated, they could just wait till everyone else is done and then say, and this is what I mean. Okay, and then have questions and, then they can and explanation this. afterwards. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that yeah. everyone still gets what they need and then they don't have to Time themselves anymore because mm -hmm. other people have talked. Yeah, that would enable everyone to, to share as well as allowing time for expansion on ideas, right? For explanation. Yeah. Is there another hand up over here? No, someone? Okay. Well, I think that sounds good. Anybody else think that sounds like a good idea? We'll try that next time. Okay. So one of the cons of your broadcast message that whenever before, whenever um, they just asked for for people to, to blurt out, it takes uh, it 
no, I'm sorry. The, the con is that, I'm sorry, these are messed up. So the pros of experiential activity is that you get input from everybody. Um, it increases the ability to create belonging in your group. It increases the use opportunity to engage in independent thought and it can increase and it, the quality and I, I put a question mark at the end of quantity um, because it it should um, everybody should be able to share at least one of their ideas um, but again it's there is a con to using the experiential method and that is it does take more time and it does require uh, preparation. However, if you'll notice from the debrief, and, and you don't have to debrief every time, but from the debrief, it did give kids an, a, a safe place to be able to say, you know, sometimes I didn't feel like I was listened to, or it was a little bit hard for me, or I would really rather if we did it this way. So it gives the kids some opportunity to give some feedback. Um, the, the, this type of uh, activity is called Think, Pair, Share, and it, we I often, whenever I separate kids up like this, I try to separate them up so that there's multiple age groups in each small group. And it, it sometimes helps uh, those individuals that are a little bit less shy and, and less um, uh, spontaneous to give them a moment to have their thoughts and, and write down some of their ideas before we ask them to just blurt out. So that is the end of our update for this year. Um, we are going to do, we're hosting eight different chat sessions. If people have questions about policy or procedures or things like that, we will be in a Zoom room, which is very similar to what uh, we are recording our presentation on today. There is a um, link at the bottom of the page, the Zoom link. It's also going to be indicated on that volunteer update page associated with our website. Uh, that is the website for that is down here. And again, I messed that one up. So I'm going to change it right here in front of everybody so that you know that this is supposed to actually right here say Snohomish. If I can. And let, let me add that those Zoom sessions, if nobody shows up to the Zoom session, they will close after 15 minutes. Right. So please uh, be there within 15 minutes if you have a question to yeah. ask. Yep. So uh, that concludes this. Please be sure and go and do the, uh, the volunteer survey here. This is the website listed here. I think it's also on the update page if you want to go there and grab it. Um, it's just some reflection questions, uh, some idea of, uh, um, telling us a little bit about what you got out of it, but it also is a, is a way for you to get credit for it. And if you fail to send that survey in, you will not get credit for viewing that. Um, this year, the update is required to be seen by all enrolled volunteers since it is uh, an electronic format and folks don't have to attend a meeting to get the information. Uh, finally, I would like to thank our youth actors uh, who are shown in the picture there. And I want to thank you guys again. I, I think we're going to have a great year. And if you have any questions, concerns, or anything like that, um, we are here for you. Uh, we aren't here 24-7, but we are here for you. And please feel free to uh, give us a call and, or send us an email and let us know what you need. Thanks a bunch. If you have any questions that, and you don't have a chance to sit in on one of those question and answer sessions, we will have the frequently asked questions posted on that update webpage as well. So you can check in there. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.